um, what it's telling the player, um, how those things might function within the context of the game. For example, with an explicit affordance, remember it's kind of the game. It's something very, it's very game centric and it's a, maybe an object with um, a shader or a highlight or something that's kind of calling out uh, to the player. We talked a little bit about metrics uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that uh, some more today. Um, establishing kind of what your standard scale is. What is the unit of scale for your world specifically so that when you're building things and you're establishing kind of limitations for the player, you're operating within a standardized kind of environment. So you know what your kind of fundamental building blocks are in terms of scale. And then when somebody comes along to, uh, to, to further your work or to add to it, whether it's an artist kind of building assets, they know what the sizes are and the constraints are with regard to size that you've already established in terms of uh, design. Um, we talked a little bit about gray area, kind of making sure that it's obvious to the player, or at least reasonably obvious to the player, the difference between an area that's inaccessible and accessible, or a, an obstacle which is insurmountable or something that they can kind of get through or get past, and trying to avoid instances of those um, those things that fall in between kind of two extremes. So the example I gave was the uh, angle of the floor. And if anything sort of 35 degrees and below is something that you can walk on. And then anything that is 55 degrees and above is something that you cannot walk on, that you don't present the player with any surface in between those two points. So that you take away uh, ambiguity. And that also um, generally the way to begin kind of thinking about environments is just to simply list your mechanics as they equate to environment. What does your player do in terms of movement? Can they run, can they walk, can they crawl, jump, climb, so on and so forth. Um, we touched on shape language a little bit, um, the very basic kind of fundamental shapes and what those convey to the player. Remember again, that that's not an exhaustive list. There are different ways to use those shapes to convey different meanings, but generally speaking, you want to think in terms of what is dangerous, what is benign, and then also what is functional. And then I've added a second um, a group of information to this, which will be new to you. And it's two, um, two separate but not distinct um, groups of criteria that you can think about as you're designing your uh, levels. So what we're thinking about right now is the functionality of the level. And so, as you would expect, the, the first sort of group of sentences there um, are titled function. And so those are the ones that you're going to be concentrating on right now. We're going to get to story a little bit um, as we move further into making this assignment where we're thinking about the context of the environment. What is the environment made from? What are the materials? What is the, um, what is the, 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 the surface that the character is moving on? What are the objects with, with which they're interacting? And how do they tie into your story? And how also do they tie into kind of the emotional impact that you want to create within the heart and mind of the player? Um, our focus right now is kind of on the big building blocks of so the function. What does this stuff actually do? And so I've given you a list here of things that you can think about as you're designing your piece of an environment. But this list is by no means comprehensive or exhaustive. There are definitely other things which you can think about and which I have no doubt you guys are going to come up with as you're sort of generating the content for your environment. But a few things to think about. Um, number one is verticality. When we think about motion, we tend to think about moving laterally. So in terms of a player controlling a character in a game, lateral movement is kind of a given. That's really sort of basic functionality. You expect to be able to move your player backwards and forwards through the environment or side to side and backwards and forwards, depending on what kind of game it is that you're making. But how much the player moves up and down is really determined by you, the designer, more than it is the player. Somebody might put, um, somebody might play Super Mario Brothers, for example, and they might spend the entire game just jumping through the game and never really running. You as the designer are never in control of what the player actually does with your product and you can't really anticipate that somebody might use the product in that way but if they're actually going to interact with the game in any kind of meaningful sort of way and if they're going to actually try and complete a level or try and complete the game there's going to come a point where they have to jump where they have to jump on a platform or they have to jump over a gap and that necessity to use that mechanic and to move vertically has been provided by you guys, the designers. So very often when we think about environments, we're tending to think about flat surfaces and kind of moving to and fro. As much as possible, I want you guys to think about verticality because that's really how you guys dictate the experience of the level. How much do you make the player move up and over things or go under things, around things or through things? 
Um, we talked a little bit already about guidance and constraints. So how is it that you're actually defining what the playable area is for the player? Do you go the God of War route and have kind of invisible walls around all of your playable areas? Or do you go kind of the um, early Lego Star Wars games whereby you were always kind of standing on like a free floating platform that didn't really seem to be attached to anything else? And you surround the player with um, hazardous falls, you know, falls which are going to kill the player. And so by definition, they're going to want to stay um, on that uh, playable area. You don't need to provide them with an arbitrary invisible wall. They kind of police themselves in terms of which area is playable and which isn't. Um, obstacles, what are you going to put in front of the player? How do they interact with them? How does that kind of create and encourage gameplay? Terrain, what, what, what actually is the terrain? Is it consistent? Are there areas that affect gameplay by being slippery or do they slow the player down? Do you have the player move through kind of like a swamp or something like that whereby their um, motion is kind of impeded? Um, do you have areas of the environment which are breakable? Um, a, a platform that you jump onto and then it kind of quivers to denote to the player that it's going to break if they spend any, any more time there and the signal to them then is that they need to jump off that platform to another one. That's quite tropey, it's, it's kind of gameplay 101, but it's also extremely effective and I would encourage you not to shy away from uh, concepts like that which are simple because they're really compelling in terms of creating gameplay. Um, puzzles, don't feel like you need to actually design a puzzle right now that works. Um, we don't really have the time or kind of the scope to do it. But you can create the implication of there being puzzles by putting things like levers, handles, um, other things in the environment which you would traditionally associate with puzzles that the player could interact with, but you don't need to necessarily spell out exactly how that's going to work at this stage. Obviously, you've got to think about what is um, totally mortal in your environment. So what is it that's going to kill the player outright? So whether that's a spike trap or whether it's lava, Maybe in your game, water is, in kind of the traditional sense, completely lethal and your character can't swim, so if you fall in water, you drown. And conversely, what are you going to establish for the player as a hazard? Something from which they can take damage, which they should avoid, but isn't necessarily going to kill them outright. You want to be able to visually distinguish between those two things when you're the, the, the player. So they may be cultural affordances that the player can just look at and understand, or they may be inferred affordances. So in the case of water, when I see water in the real world, unless it's kind of like a raging torrent, I don't think I'm going to die if I fall in it because I'm a reasonably good swimmer. But in the case of your game, water might be fatal and so that would fall under the category of an inferred affordance. That's something that you need to teach to the player that within the context of your game is fatal. So as I say, it's not an exhaustive, totally comprehensive list, but these are all good things to be thinking about as you're trying to figure out what your environment is going to be. Now to give you guys an example, Ultimately, what our um, piece of kind of um, environment uh, art is going to end up looking like and what you're going to actually submit in the end, it's going to be something kind of like this. This is one that I made last year as an example um, in, in a demo for the class. I actually think, oh, you can't even really see it, can you? Um, it's, not, it's not a great example. There's really not any, much in here that's particularly exciting. Um, but it's, it's roughly representational, re representational of visually what the environment is. So obviously it's a building site, um, and these are kind of the skeletal superstructures of buildings. And then there are scaffolds, uh, a cement mixer, pipes, and uh, fences, which are all kind of visual accoutrements which you would associate with a building site. But there's also a function which is associated with them as well. I established what the metric was for um, surfaces on which the, the character can and can't climb. And so the, the superstructures themselves cannot be climbed directly and nor can the fence. And we talked a little bit about this last week. As a cultural um, affordance, chain link fence is a little bit kind of tricky. When we look at it, we do know that we can actually climb that. Um, but very often it's used in games as a sort of uh, a firm uh, barrier that the, the player cannot get past. They can't climb it even though in, the, in real life we know that we can. Um, I've used it in the same way here. The player can't climb the fence, but what they can climb is the scaffolding. The scaffolding by um, establishing kind of a specific height for each section of the scaffold, the player can climb those sections and then jump over the fence and potentially jump onto the superstructure of the buildings to uh, interact with that as well. And even though it's not visually kind of spelled out here, the idea with this environment was that um, trolls would spawn on the other side of the two fences and as the character is trying to make their way through the environment, trolls would come to attack them, 
uh, and there would be a mechanic where the, the, the player would use the cement mixer to flood the ground with cement, thereby slowing down the trolls, and then they would destroy the um, restraints holding the, the pipes in that stack, and then the pipes would fall down and crush the trolls and kill them. Um, so obviously that's not spelled out here in the map, that would be spelled out in a storyboard. But I have the implication of function and of gameplay because those elements are here in the uh, environment design. They make sense both functionally, or at least they do to me because I'm the designer of the game, but also they make sense contextually. They don't look like they don't belong in this environment, they're clearly meant to be here. So this is kind of our, this is a poor example of, but it's an example of kind of our final destination where we're going to use some color, some texture, and some detail to contextualize our environment design. But what we're not trying to do is actually create a piece of super polished concept art or kind of a recreation of a screenshot. Some people technically aren't going to be able to um, make that because their sort of skill level as it equates to art isn't necessarily going to be there. But also more importantly, within the context of a, of a, a development studio or a development scenario, um, you guys as designers, that's not necessarily your job. Your job really is to design this stuff, figure out how it's going to work, and then you hand it off to the art staff who then beautify it. But there is some value to thinking about what the context of these um, objects are and what the context of your environment is, so that when you deliver the design to the artist, you aren't saying, well, you're in this super lethal environment um, that's really, really dangerous to the player. And functionally speaking, it's, it's very high leverage or high tension because we're going to kill the player a lot. But um, actually what you're inside is like a giant marshmallow. Um, that's, that's dissonant in terms of the function and the narrative not meshing with one another. So even though you guys don't design the final look of levels, you are deciding what goes in them. And you want to try and make the story and the function kind of jive with one another. Um, so in an effort to kind of um, describe to you guys what I would advocate sort of doing next in terms of designing your environments, you create your list of mechanics as they equate to um, moving through the environment, motion, climbing, so on and so forth. And then you give yourself a list of instances, oh, sorry, affordances of things that you can put in your environment which are going to facilitate or necessitate the player using those mechanics. Once you've done that, you need to think about your metrics and kind of how are you going to build your environment consistently. Now, I hasten to add, I am not a level designer. I've, I've worked with lots of them and, and talked about kind of what works and what doesn't. Somebody at some point, you're going to have a level design class. I think you guys have a 2D level design class first. Somebody's going to show you to do this, how to do this in a much more comprehensive way than I'm going to. But the reason why I've done this is because if you guys haven't got the impression of this already, I'll just reiterate it. In my mind, making visual design where you're communicating specific visual concepts to the player and you're telling them story, if that's totally divorced from function, you might as well not do it. If it's not contributing somehow to how the game works or how the game plays or the experience for the player, what is the point? Because ultimately that is what games are all about. So to, to give myself some grist for the mill, as it were, I've come up with these metrics for um, a level so that I have something, I have kind of a system, if you like, that I can design into. So um, given that I don't have a game, uh, a kind of a hypothetical game that I'm sort of working on, um, but I, I'm trying to do something similar to what you guys are doing, I thought about sort of, um, sort of breaking down and figuring out what the metrics would be for a Prince of Persia game. So I made that document in Photoshop, and Photoshop has a neat function, um, which is kind of like working on graph paper, where you can have Photoshop create a grid that exists in the background of your document, and I'm going to show you guys what it looks like. So anytime that you're working on the metrics of your um, levels, and you're talking about um, establishing kind of what your units of scale are, you need some kind of visual, visual consistency um, that you can kind of design within. So in the case of Photoshop, there we go. If you go to your view menu um, and you go to uh, show, you have the sub menu here. You can call up your grid and the hot key for it is control um, apostrophe. And that's what it looks like. And so that's what I've used. Um, although my artwork doesn't really line up to it because this isn't my computer. Um, it lined up in my computer at home. But basically I've treated this like graph paper. Um, I said that one unit of scale was four squares. Um, and in relative to the size of a person, each one of those squares is roughly um, one foot by one foot. 
Um, I'm a Imperial Measures guy, you guys might be metric, it really doesn't matter. Just as long as you um, develop some kind of consistency when you're actually figuring out what your distances and measurements are going to be. So, you're familiar probably from last week with what these two um, triangles up here at the top mean. Basically the green triangle means that anything that is 35 degrees or below is a surface which the player can interact with and can walk on. Anything that's 55 degrees or above is going to be something that the player cannot interact with. But I'm going to create no surfaces that exist in the angles between these two, unless I absolutely have to. And even then I'm going to try and make it so that it's clearly not accessible to the player. Because I don't want there to be that ambiguity or that confusion on the part of the player. I want them to see surfaces that they know that they can run on and see surfaces which they clearly can't run on and be able to tell the difference between the two. Um, what I have down here with these two bars is kind of a, a, um, a visual representation of jumping in the game. So what I've given uh, with these two sort of green boxes is an area of tolerance um, before you actually reach the edge of um, a, a ledge or a platform. And provided the player leaps or jumps within that kind of box, um, that area of tolerance, they can make it to the other side. So this distance would can constitute kind of the, the furthest distance that a player can successfully jump. But I'm never going to give the player a gap that they can't jump that's any smaller than this one here. So I want there to be clearly a division between the two so that there's no ambiguity for the player. I think actually to err on the side of caution, I would probably make my kind of minimal uh, inaccessible jump even slightly bigger than that. It still seems like they're kind of similar. Um, these three columns are indicative of the distances between um, uh, columns that project out of the floor or ceiling that the uh, character can jump and climb onto and then jump from column to column. So the green ones constitute the distance uh, which the character can jump successfully and then the first green one and the red one would be an indication of how far apart I would put columns when I want the player to understand that they can't jump that far. Um, it, basically the scale is the same. These dots down here are representative of um, poles or flag posts that project out of the wall that in Prince of Persia you can jump and grab hold of and kind of swing around. Um, and then these three boxes down here are to do with height. So this object here would be the height of objects which the character can simply vault over and just clamber onto as they walk or run. And then um, my green box here would be a ledge that the character can jump up and grab onto the ledge and then shimmy onto. And then any other vertical um, space in the, the um, game that's going to have a ledge at the top of it, I'm going to make no shorter than this red one here. This is clearly inaccessible to the player and I don't want to create any ledges which are between these two heights. So I'm not creating any confusion um, and things are clear to the player. So I don't think I've hit all of the um, sort of necessary metrics that I would need for um, developing the different mechanics that are in that game, but there's a few in there that you could definitely use to kind of um, put in conjunction with one another to create a sequence of gameplay. So does everyone understand what this is, like visually speaking what they're looking at? Yep. So all of these shapes are built out of that square. So if I'm trying to think about placing an object um, in the context of this game, I can say that it's like six squares high, or it's five squares high, or I can refer to it in feet. It doesn't matter to how I refer to it as long as I'm consistent in terms of using that unit of scale. All right, so once I'd made that, um, I then uh, imported it into SketchUp. Now, who in the room knows how to use a 3D program? Anybody? Anyone a 3D artist? A Little bit, a little bit. So I'm gonna preface this by saying if you already know how to use Blender, 3ds max or maya we have all of those programs on these computers please feel free to use those um, for this assignment um, but what we're going to do is we're going to use a little bit of geometry a little bit of 3d work to kind of figure out how our um, levels are going to work at their most basic i hasten to add that we're not going to put these into an engine we're not going to apply collisions to them and have a character actually run on them because um, we just don't have the time to do that also i am not the person to teach you how to do that um, we're doing this just to kind of get used to the concept of gray boxing and thinking purely about functionality and then adding a little bit of um, sort of visual veneer to that to contextualize what it is that we're making. So most of you in the room are probably going to use SketchUp for your um, geometry and your gray boxing. Um, SketchUp is great because you can learn to use it like literally in 10 or 15 minutes. Um, 3ds Max, Maya and even Blender are all much more robust as programs. You can do a lot more stuff with them. 
So when you guys use SketchUp, you're gonna see that it has its limitations right off the bat. But if you are sort of unfamiliar in terms of using um, 3D software, it's a good way to kind of dip your toe into that water and maybe it's a good warm up in terms of you guys starting to think in terms of three dimensions before you move on to any of those more complicated programs. So for those of you who do know how to use kind of a more grown up 3D program, feel free to turn your brain off a little bit um, for a few minutes. Um, but for those of you who don't, I'm gonna just quickly run through some of the basic functionality of how to use SketchUp and also how I want you to apply it to this assignment. So if I open up this file, you'll see um, when you open SketchUp, you get a dialog box. Um, I'm gonna agree to the license agreement. Okay, you get this dialog box and it's gonna ask you to buy SketchUp Pro. Don't buy SketchUp Pro, there's no need to do that. Um, the only thing I would advocate you doing is choosing which template you're gonna use. So basically what you do here is you define which kind of metrics you're gonna use um, for generating your model. I'm a feet and inches guy. So I, I tend to err on the side of feet and inches, but feel free to work in a metric if you so choose. And generally speaking, I pick architectural design because it's the least cluttered. It doesn't give me this green uh, ground and a blue sky. It's just a gray ground and a gray sky. And I find that easier to use once I export this um, model as a 2D image and work on top of it in um, Photoshop. So I hit I agree, the program's gonna open up. Hopefully, there we go. Now, by default, your uh, tool set is quite small. Um, you just have these tools up here. Um, there are more tools in the program uh, and they're accessible by going to your view menu and then clicking on toolbars. And if you scroll down, you should see your large tool set, which is right here. And if I click on that, it introduces some more tools um, to, your, to your tool set. But generally speaking, for the purposes of what we're gonna do, um, everything here on the, 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 the top layer um, in terms of tools is probably enough for what it is that you're gonna attempt. So um, basically what I did is I imported my um, PNG of my uh, metrics into the program. And the way that you do that is by going to File, Import, finding that uh, file. Uh, I could have sworn I copied it onto the desktop. Yeah, there it is. Oh, duh, I know what I'm doing. So File, Import. You have to actually tell uh, SketchUp which type of file you're looking for, which is a little bit awkward. So in this drop down menu here, I know it's a PNG. So if I select a PNG and I go to desktop, there it is. So environmental scale diagram.png, I import it. It has to think about it a little bit. And when you import things into, um, into uh, SketchUp, you have to orient them in the environment. So I'm just gonna plunk this one right here. And then you also have to scale it. So right now it's scaling it sort of um, relative to the um, central origin point. And so when I imported it the first time, I just kind of arbitrarily made it this big right here. Um, what you can do is try and match up your um, document to the native scale of SketchUp. So I'm in feet and inches. So if I made myself a, um, a, a, a square, a square shape, and that's in your shapes menu up here, and I put this down here on the floor, if you see, you guys can just about see it, I think in the bottom right hand corner, it's actually telling me what the dimensions of my square are as I create it. So right now it's four feet, uh, five and nine sixteen inches. So I could potentially make this a specific size if SketchUp would let me. Come on, SketchUp. Oh, well. Anyway, I could make it a specific size and then I could try and match my, um, match my document and scale my document uh, to match the size of this unit here. But for the purposes of what we're doing, it's kind of arbitrary, provided that you match the scale of what you make in, in Geo to your, um, to your uh, image. So let me just delete a bunch of this stuff. And this is the, the Geo that I made before. If I get rid of that hidden geometry, you can see that I've just mocked up a really, really simple um, approximation of a corridor where I've got a gap that the player can jump, a ledge that they can climb, another gap, and then uh, a sequence of columns that they can interact with and jump 
one from the other. They can turn a corner, drop down onto this platform, make another jump, climb up a ledge, and then jump along onto these poles and swing from these poles and get to another point. And presumably I would provide another ledge for the character to land on. So it's very, very simple, but very, very quickly, there's the clear indication of kind of functionality and how this would work. And so it's not difficult to kind of imagine taking this file, exporting it. So file, export 2D graphic, I'll save it as a PNG on the desktop. And then opening this PNG in Photoshop, or maybe opening it directly in Photoshop. And then I can paint and draw on top of it and begin to contextualize what this stuff is. So presumably if it's a Prince of Persia game, I'm in a stone corridor in some kind of palace. And so maybe I, I use some color or some very cheap texture to indicate kind of what these um, surfaces are. But ultimately what we're concerned with is kind of how these things fit together and how they work and, and implying sort of function um, for the player in terms of what it is that they're doing. So, I'm going to delete all of this stuff and I'm just going to run through some of the basic functionality of the program. So for anyone who's not used 3ds Max or Maya, you've probably seen other people use it and you understand that most 3D packages are about placing vertices and their connecting uh, edges in 3D space and then creating polygons from um, placing those, uh, those vertices and edges in 3D space. SketchUp doesn't really work that way. It does deal with the same thing. It has vertices, um, polygons or faces and edges in it. Um, but for example, the vertices, you can't um, interact with them directly. They're just created and they're there in the program, but there's no tool um, through which you can actually interact with them. The beauty of SketchUp for kind of beginners is that really it sort of works on a two dimensional sort of basis. And what you do is you create basic primitive shapes. So in this case, a rectangle, and, and your sort of list of primitive shapes is here in this drop down menu. You've got a rectangle, a rotated rectangle, whatever that is, a circle, and then a polygon. Um, and then you're interacting with these basic, sh basic shapes to make them three dimensional. So, in terms of navigating around your workspace, you have this cluster of tools here. You've got your tumble tool, which rotates you around your uh, model. You've got your hand or move tool which operates in much the same way as the hand or move tool does in Photoshop, moving you uh, upwards and down and, and backwards and forwards and side to side. And then you have your zoom tool, which as the name would apply, zooms you um, in and out of your model or your geo. And really that's, that's all you need to know in terms of getting around uh, the model. Um, in 3ds Max and Maya, generally speaking, your workspace is divided into kind of four panels. And the four panels show you kind of like the different views of your model. One of them is usually in three quarters like this one or in perspective. And then the other ones are elevation views of your model. So looking at it from the side, the top, and from um, the, the, um, the other sort of horizontal axis. While SketchUp doesn't show you those things all the time, you can use it to kind of approximate those views. And in terms of navigating the document, in your camera menu, you have this list of standard views. So if you want to snap to a top-down view of your geometry, you just go to top. And conversely, if you want to look at it from the front, you go to front and so on and so forth. Um, also, if in camera you switch off perspective and then go to top, then you're looking at an elevation or plan view of your uh, model. So in terms of getting things to line up properly with one another, this is a really, really useful tool to have. Um, bear in mind that if you don't turn perspective back on and you start to tumble around your model, things will look really, really weird. So you do need to uh, sort of re-engage that when you're looking at your uh, model again in 3D. So that's how you move around the, uh, the workspace. And using the, the um, shapes tool is how you create primitive shapes. Um, and by default, they're always kind of mapped to the floor of the uh, the model so that sort of the ground plane if you like once you've got these shapes the next thing you want to take a look at is the push pull tool which is this one up here it's also in the large tool set here and, and this is really the beauty of sketchup as a program is that you make 2d shapes and then you simply extrude them into geometry 
using the push-pull tool. And so you can use it additively or subtractively. So you can uh, push-pull to make things bigger or smaller. Um, if you hold down uh, control, um, you always, for almost any uh, control in this program, for almost any tool, if you hold down the control key, what that does is it acts as a sort of modifier for that tool and it makes it additive. So when you're using the push-pull push -pull tool, for example, what it does is it moves faces. But if you want to duplicate that face, if you hold down control, um, when you then move that face, it actually creates additional geometry. So it's quite easy to see how very quickly you can build out sort of um, scope and complexity to your model without really very much effort at all, which is one of the reasons why I like this program so much. Whoops. Whoop. There we go. Uh, you can do the same thing here on the column if SketchUp will cooperate with me. There we go. And so on and so forth. So that's how you make basic primitive shapes. And generally speaking, you guys don't need to worry too much about making your shapes more complex than sort of boxes and cylinders, unless you have something really specific that it is that you want to try to create. Um, what you can also do is you can use your line tool, which is represented by this pencil here, to create additional shapes on the faces of your objects, which you can then also interact with. So let's say, for example, I wanted to change this box here at the end to being kind of a more triangular shape. I could take my line tool and it snaps to edges and points. So I'm going to snap it to this point here and then make it snap to this point over here. And what I've done is divided this face. So now I can interact with these faces independently. So I can use the push-pull tool to change these faces and add some more complexity to this shape. Um, if you want to use this tool subtractively, what you'll find is if you um, push-pull the tool so that two faces meet, like so, what the um, program will do is it'll just take that as a cue that you want to get rid of that geometry, and so it will actually uh, kind of delete that geo, um, which is potentially kind of a, a useful little tool. When you're making a uh, geo and you want to select it, by default, um, the program will select the, the, the constituent part of that geometry on which you click. So in this case, I'm clicking on faces, so it's selecting those faces, but I could also click on um, the edges of these models, uh, should I need to interact with them in some way. But if you, need to, uh, if you need to interact with the whole of that piece, you can double click on it on a face and it'll um, select both the face and all of its associated edges. And then if you triple click on it, it will select all of the edges and faces in that particular model. Now, the reason why that's important is because um, you guys should know that um, Geo in SketchUp is sticky, it's adhesive. Um, and this is sort of indigenous to this 3D program and it doesn't work this way in any other. So that might seem counterintuitive and I'm gonna give you an example of exactly what that means. I'm gonna make another um, square and I'm gonna use the push-pull tool to turn it into a box and then I'm gonna select it. Now, SketchUp loves to snap corners and edges together. So I'm gonna move this and I'm gonna snap it to this corner right here. Oh, come on, SketchUp. So now because these are just raw geometry, anytime that you're working with raw geometry in SketchUp and you bring two edges together, they are going to stick and adhere to one another. So if I now try and move this piece of geo, it's going to distort the geometry that it became attached to, like so. Now in some cases, when you're trying to build up models, that's really, really useful because it means you can build them up really, really quickly. But obviously it doesn't take a genius to figure out that in some ways that's sort of prohibitive. So generally speaking, what I try to do, and this is good, this is sort of standard practice for any um, 3D pro program, is that when you're trying to model something, you model it in isolation, and then you don't place it into context until after you've modeled it. And then maybe you scale and adjust it once it's in context, but you're trying to model things separately. But eventually you're gonna reach a point where you don't want the geo to stick together. So let's say this is a column and I want to use it and I want it to be non-adhesive, and I want to be able to place lots of different versions of it in my environment. Uh, once I've finished modeling it, if I press G, the hotkey, or I press this button right here in my uh, large tool set, where it says make component, it brings up this dialog box and I can give this asset a name. So I'm going to call it column and then hit create. And then what that does is it changes the um, UI, oh, once the program's thought about it, I guess. It changes the UI. So when you um, select raw geo, 
Again, you're selecting only its constituent parts until you triple click it, and then you've got the whole thing selected. Once something is a component, if you click on it once, because the program is anticipating that you aren't modeling it anymore, um, it gives you this much clearer, kind of thicker, uh, more defined um, blue user interface. And you can move this model around and you can have it, you can have edges touch other edges and other pieces of geo, and it's non-adhesive. Um, it's gonna move around independently of other pieces of geometry. The other advantage is it makes it easy to rotate um, this piece of geo. When you hover over it with a move tool, you get these little kind of red uh, plus signs. And when you hover over those, it gives you a rotate tool relative to um, the geometry's central axis. So if I want to rotate this 90 degrees and turn it into a pipe, that's pretty easy to do. Generally speaking, the rotate tool, um, which is this one right here, is kind of one of the one of people's sort of least favorite parts of uh, SketchUp, but there's no reason why you can't use it uh, and you can't use it effectively. When something isn't a component and you need to rotate it, um, generally speaking, you want to try and um, have your rotate tool uh, rotate an object around a point. So in this case, I'm going to rotate my object around this endpoint. And what you do is you constrain which axis you're going to rotate that object in by pressing the arrow keys. So I hover over that point, and then by scrubbing through the arrow keys, I can see which axes I can rotate it in. I want to rotate it in the um, vertical axis, so I leave it be, uh, blue. I uh, click to establish that's the axis in which I'm going to use it. And then what I do is I create this virtual handle by kind of dragging it out. I make a second click, and then I can rotate that object around that point. And if you look at that numeric field down at the bottom of the screen, you can actually see the angle uh, which I'm rotating it. And I believe if I just sort of set it arbitrarily to 67 degrees, if I actually punch in a numerical um, number, put in 90, and then hit return, it'll snap it uh, to that number, which is kind of handy. So what are you guys going to do with it? So I'll just get rid of these guys. These are my metrics down here. And so I made these primitive models based on my um, scale guide. So I've got my metrics here in terms of scale. And then I made these boxes right on top of those. And here I'll show it to you in top view and I'll turn off perspective. So that you can see in terms of distances, all of these things line up. Um, the, the, the boxes that constitute the different heights in the game, obviously that doesn't make sense because we're looking at it in the wrong axis. Um, and when you look at it in three quarters, it makes a little bit more sense, like so. So these are my different relative heights. Um, but all of these assets are um, components. So they're non-adhesive um, and I can move them around without them getting stuck to other things. The other good thing about making um, Geo into components in the program is that you have your components menu over here. And so what you can do is if you're looking for a specific component, is you can just click it, click on it here in your components menu, and it'll just generate another instance of that model uh, in SketchUp. One more thing I should mention about components, and here I'm just going to copy one of the ones that I have. So um, I'll take this box right here. Um, actually, you know what? I'm going to duplicate it. So to duplicate things, you can either uh, Control C, Control V. Or alternatively, using the move tool, you can hold down control and you get a little plus sign and it creates a duplicate of that, that geometry. Because these two things are identical uh, components, if I edit one, and the way I do that is by double clicking on the component and now I can edit it as I would do raw geometry. If I edit the component, all other versions, all brothers and sisters of that component are going to um, have the same corresponding edit. So that can be really useful if you have lots of instances of a um, piece of geo in your uh, model and you want to sort of make universal or global changes to all of them at the same time. But obviously that could be potentially prohibitive as well. If you want to edit one and not make changes to the other, that's easy enough to do. You just right click on your component and you say make unique. And now it's given me a second um, version of my component in here. Um, and I can edit this one without affecting the original or its brothers and sisters and so on and so forth. All right, I'm going to delete it because I don't need it. Uh, and this one too. Uh, it's backspace to delete things when you have uh, highlighted them, by the way. So I want to start building some really simple um, geometry for 
kind of corridors and jumps and so on and so forth because of course it's a Prince of Persia game so I'm gonna start off by making a simple rectangle which is gonna be my uh, corridor so I'm sort of picking the, the size of this reasonably arbitrarily I guess I should really be looking at my um, metric here in terms of kind of unit of scale but relative to my kind of human figure it seems like a, a good size for a corridor and I want to make it sort of reasonably high up so that I'm already creating the idea that if the player falls off here um, they are gonna not survive it's obviously much higher than my sort of interactive height as well that's another metric that you could establish um, on, on your um, kind of size chart is what is a height or what is a fall that's potentially going to kill the player if you have that in your game obviously in some games um, falls don't kill players but in many games they do and so establishing what that height is is potentially really useful so I'm going to duplicate this geo by holding down control and uh, SketchUp very helpfully will try and constrain that motion into an axis and in this case it's in the red axis so I know that these two blocks are lined up with one another and then I'm going to take my uh, jump metrics and I'm going to copy and paste them I'm just going to punch in a little bit and because SketchUp will very helpfully try and snap sort of corner to corner I'm going to snap that corner there and then I'm going to take this box here and snap this corner to that one there and now I have two sections of corridor with a jump um, that I know the player can make in between now the the distance of that jump relative to the corridor seems kind of crazy the corridor seems massive so I'm gonna reduce the width of my corridor a little bit by using the push pull tool and then I want to do the same thing to um, this geometry over here when you're using the push pull tool in fact when you're moving anything in this program you can use other edges and surfaces to kind of tell um, the program which uh, height or width to make it so I want these two blocks to be the same width so if I use the push pull tool here but then move my cursor over to this face it's going to snap to um, that same uh, depth in terms of 3D space and it's going to make my two blocks the same width so there we go I've got two sections of corridor with a jump they're kind of huge uh, for the purposes of what we're doing I would encourage you to keep the scope of what you try and do sort of reasonably small so I'm going to um, take this face here and push it in a little bit to make my corridor a little bit less long and I'm also going to make a division on this face and take this face here and push it down a little bit and what I want to do is put a jump or oh, sorry a ledge that I can uh, clamber onto so I'm going to take my ledge uh, metric I'm going to copy and paste it and then because SketchUp is going to helpfully try and snap this corner to this top ledge here now I know how high to make this surface relative to the one above it so I'm going to snap it to that corner so now I know thanks to my metrics that I've got a section that the player can run along here they can jump up and grab this ledge climb up onto it and then perform a jump uh, from one point to the other so even though what I've got here in terms of geometry is painfully simple I've already got the implication of functionality so maybe I do the same thing again and in this case I'm gonna take this face here and push it down so it meets the other face below it so that it disappears whoops oh. there we go no oh. I'll just delete these pieces down here like so so I've got another gap and now I want to make another jump for the player so I don't need these metrics up here anymore whoops so I'm just gonna move them over here oh. and snap this corner to that one and now I need to move this face so that again I've got a jump that the player can actually make like so so very very quickly I'm establishing what the player can and can't do and if it's sort of relevant I can start building up some other sort of 
simple pieces of the environment. So I'm going to turn all of these into components. So I don't know, I'll just call this corridor one, corridor two, and inevitably corridor three. And then maybe what I want to do is create a wall next to it to indicate the fact that the player is constrained by sort of um, the normal physical constraints of a building. So I'm just going to draw a box down here. Um, that's way too big. But there's my wall. Ah. And then maybe I constrain this face to this edge here by sliding my cursor over it. And so even though this is just flat boxes this is really what a gray box should look like it doesn't look very attractive it's not aesthetically very very pleasing this is the type of geometry that you can actually put right into the engine um, apply collisions to it put your playable character on there and actually have the character move around and try actually playing the game very very quickly so at this stage in terms of gray boxing your level you just or i should say your level gray boxing your environment your little section of an environment you're thinking about functionality how can I imply that for the player? What am I putting in there? Gaps that they can jump, ledges that they can climb, objects with which they can interact, and also trying to establish what your kind of consistency is in terms of scale. That should be your focus. And then when we export this document, or this image, I should say, when we export it and we take it into Photoshop, then we're gonna think about dressing it a little bit and trying to contextualize what this stuff actually is. And then think also about our um, shape language and what is it that we're saying to the player Uh, are we going to have kind of benign shapes? Are we going to have dangerous shapes? And are we, obviously, um, we've got lots of functional shapes because already in this model, we've got lots of um, horizontal or straight edges, which generally speaking mean that that's something for the player um, to use or something that they can do with. So all of you guys need to think about what your environment's going to be, list those mechanics, list the different things that you're going to put in the environment that you can use, and then start thinking about building them up in a very, very simple way in terms of geometry. Now, I've gone through SketchUp fairly quickly. Like most programs, the best thing to do is just to start to horse around with it and kind of use it um, in terms of learning how best it works. Um, but it really is that simple. Um, if you want to color any of your um, geometry, that's really easy to do. You just select the geo that you want to apply color to and then choose your paint bucket. And then you want your colors and there's a whole bunch of thumbnails in here um, and you can select a color and then use the paint bucket tool to apply that color to that geo. But don't worry too much about color here unless you're trying to establish functionality. Something should be a particular color if the player can do something with it. Uh, but generally speaking, we can color things easily enough in Photoshop after the fact. So really you're just thinking about here about shape, divisions between shapes and distances and so on and so forth. Any questions about anything that I just covered there? I realized that was quite a lot. No? All right, awesome.